See, I think a lot of people just know, but they don't know that they know that they know. Ah. Okay. See, Michael Jordan, when he took the court, he knew that he knew that he knew that he was Michael Jordan. Yeah. I think some people just kind of know. Welcome, everybody, to The Chris Harder Show, where we are making you unapologetic about your pursuit of success, knowing that when good people like you make good money, they can then do great things. My name is Chris Harder, and several times per week, I will bring you epic guests, solo episodes, and every single tool, trick, and skill set you need to grow your business, grow your money mindset, and to grow your wealth to levels that you have never reached before. I've ended up in a unique place in life where I've got the experience, the connections, and all of the secrets that it takes to be successful. And I'm lifting the curtain to reveal it all to you in an effort to help put you in a position of abundance so great that you can then be as generous as possible. So let's lock arms and let's get started. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to The Chris Harder Show. I am really excited for our interview today. So I'm sitting down with a longtime dear friend of mine, Tim Story. Now, the reason I'm excited is the past year has flown by and Tim and I have lost touch. Like I haven't really had a chance to reach out and say, hey, how's it going? And he's got a brand new book that I'm really excited about called The Miracle Mentality. And if there's ever been a time in this world that we need to be able to recognize and focus and create miracles, it is right now. So you're going to love this interview because we talk about those small daily miracles and how to recognize those better instead of waiting for the big one. Because when you concentrate on the small, consistent miracles, it far outweighs the production than compared to just waiting for that great big chance miracle that might happen for you. This episode is full of good feelings and motivation and inspiration. It's going to pick you up from wherever you are right now and help bring you to wherever you want to go. And that's because every time Tim speaks, it's darn near miraculous. You know, you've seen him on Super Soul Sunday with Oprah. You've seen him all over Fox News and CNN and the Huffington Post. And he's known as the life coach to the stars. He is the one that privately and personally works with all of the A-listers that you know to help them make comebacks and get to the next level. And a lot of that is what has brought Tim to writing the miracle mentality because he has seen how the small daily miracles play such a big role to create larger miracles. And by the way, Make sure you get all the way to the end because at the end, I surprised him by saying, I'm going to give 20 of you, yes, you listeners, I'm going to give 20 of you his book either on audio or uh, an actual physical copy. And so to learn how to get one of his books on audio or physical copy on my dime, I'll buy it and send it to you personally. Make sure you get all the way through to the end and then do the small request that I make of you at the end. Matter of fact, spoiler alert, simply share your favorite takeaway on Instagram, tag both Tim and I. I'm going to choose 20 of you at random to get his new book. So get ready, listen up, expect miracles, because that's what we're about to talk about with Tim's story right now. All right, Tim, my friend, welcome back to the show. How are you doing? What a privilege. I want to talk to you about your t-shirt wearing. <laughs> I, love, I love that you love to wear t-shirts. Has that been for a long time? Yeah, I'll tell you what, I'm a lazy dresser. I'm just going to put it right out there. I see you with your good fashion all the time. And even when you're casual, you look great. I have become the laziest dresser ever. You and I were talking a little bit about um, you know, when my father passed in June. It went, yes. When that happened, it took someone who was already prone to always just want to wear t-shirts. And it solidified this simplicity that I was seeking. And I didn't want to waste any energy on getting ready or, or getting dressed up. I have a dinner tonight. It's funny you bring this up. I have a dinner tonight with another couple with Lori. And yes. all I can think about is, oh, the, the thought of putting on real pants and a real shirt sounds horrible. <laughs> no, but I, I, I'm kind of envious of you with this whole t-shirt look because it, it, it works well for you. But I'm, I'm noticing more and more people, even in business meetings, are wearing like t-shirts and jeans. I think a lot of things have changed. I think one of the um, silver linings that's come out of COVID, and we're going to talk about COVID in a little bit here, but people let down their guard. And they said, if I'm going to be doing business from home, then you're going to see my kids in the background. You're going to see me make a mistake on Zoom. You're going to see me yes. in my PJs. And it became this instant permission to let go of all the things that didn't have as much meaning anymore. 
and to, for all of us to just show up how we wanted to show up because I think we all knew that each person was just coping the best they could. And now I think some of that is, is here to stay for a while. I think so too. So speaking of which, it's been way too long since you and I have spoke, hung out. Uh, you know, I don't know how this happens in life sometimes. You've got someone you love and, and before you know it, a year's gone by and, and you've just kind of stopped communicating. And I think it's because we're both busy. But between then and now, you came out with this incredible new book, The Miracle Mentality. So first of all, congratulations. Thank you. What is The Miracle Mentality in your words? So The Miracle Mentality was something that I needed to have. And so, you know, as a, as a young person, the way we were raised lower income, Chris, like what, what I saw was not miraculous at all. So, because the word miracle, as you know, means uncommon, not normal, supernatural, extraordinary. I saw a lot of normal and worse. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And so I think for me, Again, the miracle mentality was needed. And the first time I ever saw what I would call the miracle mentality is when I went to Disneyland at age seven. Some people had given my family tickets to Disneyland because we were so uh, lower income, we couldn't afford to go ourselves. But somebody gave us tickets and I'd never seen anything like this before. I'd never seen streets so clean. I never saw a ride so high. I got to see Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, And my mind just took off into this beyond level. And so when I started studying the life of Walt Disney, I found out that in the 1930s, and you may know this story, that he walked into an amusement park and he said, hey, I'm going to build my own amusement park someday, but mine's going to be different, better, and more magical. And then he opened up Disneyland in 1955, and it was different, better, and more magical. So it's kind of cool that the fact that Disney had a miracle mentality, it showed me that living beyond what I was living was possible. That brings up a really good question because when you were talking about, hey, I grew up in an area where we didn't see miracles, right? We saw the opposite of that. How does one believe in miracles if they've never yet seen one? So for example, your first miracle, so to speak, was getting this chance to go to Disney and seeing how miraculous it could be. How does one believe in in miracles when they've never seen one? So I think that you would agree with this, is that there's there's three primary ways that we learn. One is education. Second is conversation. Third is observation. So if you go back to your childhood, you know, you were taught in school and taught by your parents, taught in different places where you were tutored and mentored. So through education, it made you think certain things. The other side of it, though, is the conversations that we can have. That you, I started hearing miraculous stories of like things that happened for people. But the third and the thing that really touched me, because I'm kind of a visual person, is the observation of seeing things happen. And um, again, going back to the Disneyland story, to see that, Chris, I was so beyond what I'd ever seen because everything in my family was cramped and crowded. And now I saw vast open space and something registered with me that there's something more possible than, than what I'm living. Yeah. It's funny because, you know, you and I offline were talking about it's been a year or more since we've seen each other and the pandemic, what lessons came from it. And so yes. I feel like I've got to ask you as somebody who was always traveling everywhere, always speaking, always pouring into people and your income and your identity was dependent yes. on a lot of that. Right. What miracles or adjustments came out of the pandemic because you're someone who seeks miracles? Yes. And that's such an excellent question because I've been traveling since I was 20 years of age. And so I've been to 75 countries and that's where uh, a lot of our income is coming in from is the traveling and you sell products and people connect to you that way and it just enhances what you do, okay? So I remember in February, I was talking to Dog the Bounty Hunter's agent 
because Dog and I were going to do a project. And she's a famous agent uh, from a uh, from Burlstein and Gray. And she said to me, Tim, now make sure you buy a refundable ticket because you never know what's going to happen with this pandemic. Now, this was like a couple months before we really knew it was going to hit. Yeah. And I called Dog the bounty hunter and I said, bless her heart. I said, we're going to be okay. And he goes, I know that's just the way she is. Well, she was right. So when when March hit, the first thing that happened to me, Mr. Man of Faith, was panic. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, whoa. So we figured it out that in a six-month period, 27 conferences that I was supposed to go to got done. Oh, just canceled. Canceled. And the, the, the amount of money is just gigantic. Staggering, yeah. Staggering. So I remember the first thing that hit me was panic. Like, whoa, this is really, really something. So I talk about in this book, Miracle Mentality, that there are different levels people live in. The mundane, which is your daily chores that we all have to do. But, th- but you should master the mundane. The second is the messy. What happened even to Tim Story's mindset is the messy started coming. I started thinking like, oh man, because I already said yes to that big project. I'm putting that much money in that big project. I'm putting that much money in that big project. And now all that money could be gone. Yep. Okay. So we have the mundane. We have the messy that can happen. But here's the third one. The madness, which which is the chaotic. So I was really hit by the messy and the madness that could have just fixed my mind. Mm-hmm. But as you know, because you teach on this, is your mindset is where you set your mind. So I had to start meditating on the right things. I had to talk to the right people. I had to have help have people help me with my own blind spots Mm -hmm. to say, Tim, we need to pivot. We need to adjust and we need to change your mentality. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. So you had two things there. You had the awareness that, oh, well, or, or, or that even though I'm encountering a mess, I know I need to take control of where I'm setting my mind, my mindset. Yes. That was number one. Number two, you had the connections to people to help you do that. I want to talk real briefly about you know, the individual who's listening right now. And they've been through the same really rough year as you and I, but probably in, in a way that is way worse. I think you and I got through it in a pretty privileged way. Yes, we did. And, and so there's a lot of people that they're still wondering how they're going to get to tomorrow. What do you say to that individual who feels like, forget a miracle that this guy's talking yeah. about. I just need to figure out how to get to tomorrow. Yes. And as you know, that's your crowd and that's my crowd because we both understand struggle. So I, I love I love the underdog. And, and here's what I would say. As you said, number one, you have to become awake. So when the challenge hits, you have to you have to wake up. If you study it in the dictionary, that means to become conscious. The second thing that you need to do is take inventory. So I had to look at how many employees did I have? Can I keep them? Where am I at? Where am I financially? What's taking place? So number one, you become awake. Secondly, you take inventory. But thirdly, you have to partner with the right people. But the beautiful thing about life nowadays is I don't have to know Richard Branson personally. Mm. I can read his book. Uh, Somebody doesn't need to know Chris Harder personally. They can read his books, or watch his podcasts. And so that's the beautiful thing of life nowadays is that you could partner with people you've never met in your life. It's almost like people people don't want to hear this, but it's true when you say there's almost no excuses because the resources are there if you look for them. Yes, 100%. So, so number one, you, you become awake. Secondly, you take inventory. Number three, you've got to partner with the right people. But it's not always Joe down the street or your cousin 
or somebody you work with for advice, you know, there's a plethora. I mean, there's, there's Ted talks I was listening to. Um, I was reading books that people were talking to me about, about how to shift, how to pivot, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you got to partner with the right people. And then here's what me and you were raised on because your father really taught you well. And that is principles. So once you have the right partners, you need the right principles. And the principles that I was raised in is this, is the biblical side of things is that even though there's an opposition to my mission, which is going to be a challenge, a battle, okay, that somehow, some way, I believe this, that God is going to make a way where there is no way. So I had to go to my faith principles, okay? And then once you have the principles, then you make the plan. I don't think you should make the plan without the principles. Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of people, out of their fear, they make a plan, but it's not the right plan because they did it out of fear. I want to take this line of questioning full circle, you know, and I want to put a bow on it before we move in the next line of questioning. And that is, what is a, a miracle that clearly came out of the pivots and the decisions and everything that you had to do? What's a miracle that came out the other side for you? Okay, so to me, I'm... A miracle is all around us at all times. Mm -hmm. And to me, a miracle is like what happened to me three weeks ago. I was having a super busy day and I was helping some people that are really struggling because, uh, as you know, I work in the recovery world as well. And there was a couple of people that were really struggling. To be honest with you, I was drained. Mm -hmm. And I was still having to be Tim's story at the same time. Okay. Yep. <laughs> so... I went in my backyard, Chris, and I was just drinking some hot tea. It was, a, it was cooler that day. And all of a sudden, as I'm drinking hot tea, not on my phone, just sitting there breathing, three butterflies came right by my ear. And they came around and they like circled and then they took off. So I happened to be talking to this lady that I know who is an interior decorator. And it was a strange thing. I remembered that she's in a butterfly. So I explained the scene. She says, Tim, that is very uncommon. And I told her what the butterflies look like, that three of them would be flowing like that together. And she goes, that's kind of a magical moment. And it was the strangest thing that I think many times we think that miracles come in a powder blue Tiffany's box. Yeah. And to me, that miracle of just butterflies flowing by was something very magical that did something to uplift my soul. There's a lesson in there that, you know, I don't know if it's an intentional or unintentional lesson, but what came to me when you said that was, had you not taken that break, had you not slowed down, had you not put your phone down, had you not sat there and just sipped your tea and created that silence for a while, you probably would have missed that miracle. It probably still would have happened. You said it best. They're going on around us at all times but I, I bet we aren't even bothering to stop and take a look or take inventory of the miracles around us. You hit, you hit a perfect spot. If you don't mind, I'd like to cultivate that a little bit because that is so on what you're saying. I think that we've become so busy that we're missing the miracles that are going on all around us. Like, for instance, one of my friend's sons uh, was talking to me and he said, hey, Uncle Tim, this was two years ago. He said, I scored my first goal today in soccer. He's only seven. And I go, whoa, how did it feel? He goes, it was awesome, but my parents didn't see it. I go, were they at the game? He goes, yeah, but they were texting. This is a true story. Oh. So, so the kid scores his first goal, he's seven. He looks up to say, look at mom and dad. And they, I mean, he said it to me. Oh, they were texting. So I think that we become such human doings instead of human beings. And that COVID really made me slow down to the speed of life. Yes, me too. And I have noticed more miracles around me that are simple miracles, that are just beautiful, simple things. They're not like me buying a company or... Yeah 
speaking to 22,000 people. It's as simple as the butterflies. Amazing. I, I've got to ask, I have no idea what the answer is going to be. Sitting there and just being, and then seeing this beautiful, you know, set a trio of butterflies come hang out by you. Is that as good of a feeling as speaking to 22,000 people on stage? Or you cannot, can you not compare the two? I think you can compare the two. And I think that I was so um, built and educated to believe that bigger is better. So I think when a lot of people think of miracles, again, they're thinking of something massive. And all of a sudden, you know, Steven Spielberg called me and offered (laughs) me a role, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. But I think that now that I've re-educated myself on the miraculous of something that is just uncommon, not normal, not regular, it's little things that I enjoy. Like, I'll give you a quick story. So I go out my front door and there's an auto club guy and he's got a car hoisted up. So I don't know a lot of my neighbors very well because I used to travel a lot. <laughs> so, so I say to the auto club guy, I go, I go, hey, I said, real nice. I go, what's happening to the car? And he goes, whoa. He goes, are you a guy named Tim Story? And I go, Yeah. And I go, wow, what happened? He goes, no, I know you. (laughs) And and so long story short, he told me that he had seen me speak in Albuquerque, New Mexico, 10 years ago. And he was at a low point in his life. And I was teaching on the setback to the comeback. And as he told his story, he just started to cry. He says, I think about you probably every week of my life. He said, because I was in such a terrible state and somebody told me, you got to see this guy. He's a combat coach. And he says, this is what he said. What a miracle that you would come out and say hello to me. Because I always said, someday I want to meet him. That's a miracle to me. That's a miracle. That's a great. And as you tell that story, and when you said, I think everyone has their sights set on a miracle being something huge, like Steven Spielberg called me and said, Hey, you get the role. Yeah. It instantly made me say, I would rather have a thousand small daily miracles than one big, massive miracle. And I feel like we skip over the thousand small daily miracles and we don't take inventory of them and we're not grateful for them and we don't even bother to notice them because we're focused on when do I get my big break or my big miracle. And that's it's such so a great beautiful. Reminder. That's so beautiful. And I, and I think that that's where I go in this book, that this, this book is not about the, the massive big break, but it's, it's really going back to aligning ourselves on how we thought when we were children. And that's why I, I bring up your father and you being a Green Bay Packers fan, because I don't know why I get touched by that because I didn't get a chance to have that opportunity because my father passed when I was 10 years of age. But when I see that you were with your father for many, many years and you guys had certain traditions that you, that you guys did. You know, to me, to me, those are miracle moments that are so awesome. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's, it's not just in these big things that we get to do, but it, it's the miracle moments that you shared in conversation with your father and hearing things about his life that you never knew, right? Yeah. yeah. To, 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 to just watch him smile because the Packers won. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. the simple miracles. The, simp, the, simp, the, simple, the simple miracles. And that's what the book is about. It's, it's about paying attention to the simple things and even going back to our childhood, as I was saying, and remembering that, let's say if our teacher said, um, Timmy's story, what do you want to be when you get older? Maybe I would have said, I want to be in the NBA. Chris, what do you want to be? Uh, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to be an astronaut. Yep. And, and just really aligning ourselves again with that childlike faith that all things are possible. You know, that's a great segue into where I wanted to take this next. Uh, so it must be a small miracle, no pun intended. But yeah. you talk about this, this childlike appreciation of miracles that we all had in the beginning. Now you've been raised in a church since you were three or four years old. Is that correct? Yes, exactly. Uh And faith 
and, and being a believer has been a massive part of your life as a, a pastor and, and everything. I mean, it's, it's been a huge part of your life. It's, it's been yes. an identity for you. And I feel like I've seen you also be wildly open to conversations about the universe and positive thinking, like you talk about in your yes. book, uh, positive mindsets, like we were talking about earlier. And I feel like we live in a time right now where people, they have a, almost tension between biblical, biblical beliefs and spiritual or woo-woo beliefs. And they're trying yes. to force people to choose one side or the other. How do you reconcile these two sides for people? That's one of my favorite questions anybody's ever asked me. I think when you think about it, so we're in Compton, California, and we're struggling. And then we move to another part of East LA that's tough too. And a family takes us to church. Okay. So it's not my fault. I'm only four. <laughs> so, so there they're telling me about, there's a guy named Noah and he built an ark. There's a guy named Abraham. What was to have a child that he did? Because I'm going to Sunday school. So I'm buying into this stuff. But I remember three years ago, I was in Houston and I was in an Uber. And a guy was looking at me through the rearview mirror. And he says, hey, has anybody ever said you look like Smokey Robinson? And I said, yes. And he goes, but that's not how I know you. He goes, were you just on CNN? And I said, I actually was. I said, just two days ago. He goes, and you're like a religious guy. I said, I wouldn't say that, but I'm a, I'm a spiritual leader, an inspirational person. And he said to me, he said, why is it that if I was raised in another country, and he says, I happen to be Muslim, that it's wrong that I was raised in that country and I'm Muslim. And I said, that's not how I see life. I said, I believe that you're made in the image of God, and so am I. That you're made in his image and likeness, and, and so am I. We've had different experiences. So I, I do hold to my experience because my experience has helped my life. But I respect you for holding on to your experience that's helped your life. And I think, Chris, that's what's made me very interesting to the world. Because in the 75 countries of the world that I've been to, I've sp spoken in mosques, in synagogues. I spoke to 34,000 people for the Catholic Church. I've been asked to tour with the Dalai Lama. And a lot of um, people would not do that. I will, because I believe that we are made in the image of God. That's how I see it. It's amazing because one could say you're the, the great aggregator of spiritual beliefs, right? You actually create a space where you invite people in to explore it based on their past and based on their goals, instead of saying, well, to come through this door, you must believe X, Y, and Z, or at least we're going to indoctrinate you that way. And I really right. think that's one of the most important roles that anybody can, can play if you're going to help somebody get from point A to point B. And that is the role of being this, this medium, so to speak, that invites them in in a safe way to at least start the conversation. Yeah, no doubt about it. And what I say to people that have challenged me in this, and I, I say that, you know, don't, don't minimize who Jesus is. And Jesus is big enough to reveal himself to these people. So if they are now followers of Tim's story and they see that I have a certain light and a certain joy and a certain peace about me, then let, let Jesus reveal himself. I don't think everything is a spoken word. I think that we are a billboard that, are, that is read by people. And that's how I like to go about life. I love that. I love that. All right. So we got to address the naysayers. We talk a lot about business and finance on this business and er, on this podcast. And of course, you always have that large contingency of people that say, well, you can't positive think your way to wealth. You can't positive think your way to a thriving business. And to a certain extent, I think you can. And of course, we're not advocating that you just sit there and think positive thoughts and all of a sudden your wealth is going to show up. But yes. what do you have to say around the naysayers that say, well, you can't just positive think your way here or you can't positive think your way there when it comes to your business, your finances? Yeah, but I, I think that part of it is the positive thinking. But then the second part where I think you're phenomenal and even better than me at this is the application side. And that's why in this book, The Miracle Mentality, I have a workbook where you can actually fill things out and 
I teach you how to take the steps to apply. And so here's what I do. So I'm working with a client and they may be doing well in life, but I teach them these steps. You first have to sit and get educated. Then you stand in what you've learned and then you slowly walk it out. So that's what I've, I love I've had. I've had the uh, advantage of watching you and Lori walk things out. So I've watched you guys walk out what you do. Then you can go from a place of walking where you think you're doing great. And then you start to run and you're like, oh my gosh, this is wild. I'm running because running is a position of passion. Okay. So now I'm watching you and hearing all these things about both of you. And I watch you as you're now beginning to soar, but you cannot soar until you sit, stand, walk, run, then you soar. Yeah. And and the, the whole positive mentality, you know, you can't quote, think your way positive to a, a place where you're soaring. I feel like you have to start when you're sitting, you have to start with those positive thoughts to even want to learn what to stand in. And then when you first stand in it, it feels uncomfortable. So you have to turn to positive thoughts again to get through that discomfort and start to apply it as you walk it out. And then let's be honest, when you're walking it out, there's more discomfort, new types of discomfort that you experience long before you run, long before you soar. And you're not going to make that transition from walking to soaring without having a positive perspective and a positive attitude around what could be. Yeah, that's a beautiful thing, you know, because I know uh, Lori did the Oprah cruise Mm -hmm. and as did I, but I was sitting with Oprah in her backyard one time just dialoguing and she asked me a very interesting question. She said, at what point in life, at what age did you know you were Tim's story? I thought that is, I've never been asked that. And I said, when I was 10. And then she gave her age when she realized she was Oprah. And I'll let her tell you the story of what her age was. But I was 10. So could you imagine I was in a cramped, crowded space with a low-income family, with a steel-working father, Bethlehem Steel, okay? And I had a mother who worked two shifts at Winchell's Donut Shop, a shift and a half, with a sixth-grade education. And I knew that I was going to have high impact. I didn't know how I was going to get there. <laughs> I didn't know who was going to help me. Chris, I just doggone saw it. Yeah. It's an inner knowing, isn't it? It's funny. People will ask, oh, when did you know this? When did you? And I could never tell you the how. I could never tell you what the journey was going to look like. But there was an inner knowing that I was going to do something that was impactful. And yes. it was going to end up being impactful in a big, big way. And that well, was- Can I tell you something? Way. If you don't mind if I give an observation as a guy older than you, please. You have a quiet confidence about you that you know that you know that you know. I don't know how you got it. See, I think a lot of people just know, but they don't know that they know that they know. Ah. Okay. See, Michael Jordan, when he took the court, he knew that he knew that he knew that he was Michael Jordan. Yeah. I think some people. Just kind of know. So where did you get that kind of quiet confidence that I pick up from you? That's, that that's you a, know that you know that you know. That's a great question. I think I can only speak to the knowing, right? So when I was young, I, I knew I wanted to do big things. I knew I wanted to make a big impact. Um, I certainly didn't know that I knew that I knew when I was kicked out of college and when I was okay. you know, planting roots in, a, in, in the car business <laughs> and then in, in the mortgage business. But I can tell you the entire time I was doing that, I knew I desired to play big and to create big outcomes. And I also wow. knew that I desired to do it in a way that brought other people along. So in other words, the, the dream wasn't sitting on top of a mountain full of riches and, and looking down on people. The dream was creating the largest group of individuals and saying, let's, let's come along together. And let's all live this extraordinary life together. And I, and that's that what that you've done. Me. And I, I have to say this because you, you will never say this about yourself. But you have paid for people to coach with me. People that you felt that Tim Story's coaching could help take them to the places they need to be. And you have spons- sponsored them. And Chris, that's the kind of person that you are. I know what you've done for our friend Lorea with helping the the homeless and feeding 
and you and Lori writing an amazing check. And so I think that that's such a beautiful thing that, you know, you knew you were going to be blessed, but there's something in you that wants to be blessed to be a blessing. And to me, that's part of the miracle mentality that I don't want to just believe in miracles. I want to release miracles. Yeah. I, I like being a, re, a miracle releaser. I, I want to I want to walk into a room and someone says, "Here comes an answer to my dilemma." Yeah, yeah, oh, that's the best. What a great statement! I want to walk into the room and I want someone to know, "Hey, I'm here to help you." And here's the yeah. answer to my dilemma. That's incredible. That's 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 well. For, first of all, thanks for the kind words. It means the world to hear that that that's your observation. And and I think the second thing is, I'm glad that it's seen. And that might sound like a really weird comment. But I'm glad that it's seen once in a while because you can do a lot of things and wonder if it's creating impact, wonder if it's taking hold, wonder if it's creating a ripple. Oh, no, I watch it because I, because I know Lorea so well. And I thought to myself, I wonder how she connected to them. And then I saw what you were doing for them. And she told me, you know, about how you guys were to her. And then the fact of what you did for different clients that came to, to me for coaching. But again, I think that's that, I think, I do believe it's part of the knowing yeah. that there's enough for us, even if we give some away. Yeah. Yeah. Amen to that. There's enough to go around and it's no fun if you have it all yourself anyways. Yes. So I know we have very little time left. I want to ask, where can we get the book and where should we be following you right now? I think the best place to follow me is just timstory.com and then it shows all the places we are, our Instagram does well and all the other things. We have different programs and projects, but the book is where all books are sold. And so you can get it audible. It's my voice. And to be honest with you, I love doing audible books. Some people don't because I'll tell you a secret, Chris, I read aloud every night of my life Mm -hmm. since I was a kid. So every night I will read at least two or three pages of a book to work on my diction and to work on my vocabulary. So for me to go in and read a book, I actually enjoy it. So you can get it audible or you can get it as a regular book. So Barnes and Noble, Amazon, wherever books are sold. I, re- it's a, I recommend it's people get the audible because you've got that voice. So here's a good example. Uh, Matthew McConaughey came out with his book, you know, six months ago, whatever it was. And, and when you found out he actually read the book, it was that much more exciting because he's got that signature voice and that signature style. Same thing with you. You've got the signature Thank voice, you. the signature style. So go get the Audible. I'm going to do something special. I know you have no idea I'm going to do this, but uh, I'll pick 20 random people, 20 hey. random people that share this episode. One takeaway, one thing that made you feel good, one thing that you learned, one aha. Uh-huh. If you share this episode and tag Tim and I, then I will choose 20 random ones to uh, buy them a book either on Audible or I'll send it to their house. And uh, I'll take I, care of all that on my end. Here. I love that. Yes. Yeah, so guys, it makes me feel good. Here's what you got to do. You have a chance to get the Audible or the real book for free. All you have to do is share this episode, tag Tim and tag myself at Chris W. Harder at Tim Story on Instagram with just what your takeaway was. Spread the goodness. A simple tag gets you a free book That's for awesome. 20 of you. So Tim, last question for you before you go. Uh, the show's tagline always is and, and always has been when good people make good money, they can do great things. I would love to hear of an example now that you've been successful and you know become the figure that you are. What is something good that that's allowed you to do? I think one of the things that I love doing out of the many nonprofits I'm a part of is I'm very close to the, the Crow Nation, the Crow Indians. I've been, been working with the Crow Nation out of Montana for over 21 years. And to go and love on them teach in their schools, educate, give them all kinds of product, mentor, tutor, and see them growing, building, starting to go to great colleges, doing great things. That's very exciting to me because, you know, the American Indians, as you know, have many times been a challenged group of people and sometimes forgotten. So I, I, I love that mission. And the fact they gave me my my own name, I have my own Indian name, what and is they it? gave me property on the reservation. It's such a long name, Chris, but what it means is warring with wisdom. Because oh. they said the best chiefs, they never shed blood. Oh. And they said, you war with wisdom. You're a peaceful man, 
and you know how to negotiate yourself to victory. I love that. I love that. What a great example. Tim, my friend, I'm so glad we got to reconnect on this. You know, yes. it's, it, I, I'm ashamed that it took a book for us to reconnect. But going forward, I promise to stay highly connected. And I'm just so grateful that you're willing to come on the show and, and share your greatness with us. Thanks for everything. My I'm pleasure. Me. Thanks for listening. And if you loved this episode and know of someone else who is as successful as they are generous, please pass them on to me. It would mean the world to me if you help me get this cause and this message out to as many listeners as I can. So please, if you liked what you heard, it goes a long way if you take 30 seconds and leave me a five-star review and share this with your friends. I'll be forever grateful. And until the next episode, cheers to your success.